Monique, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you. Brian, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and it's always nice to talk with folks from the other side of the world. So uh, this is uh, fun to have you um, share a little bit of your journey. I don't know if there's a better spot to start than, you know, we're talking about obviously happiness and how do we improve our life and, and, and obviously how do we get started in a better direction. Um, so if we can, I, I'd love to start back when you were younger, because it seemed like there was a really fine point in your life. And you can go deeper into this about you were trying to end your life or you're almost going to end your life. Right. Um, I think you were 19 or so. And my curiosity is around one, how did you get to that point? And maybe that's the first question. How'd you get to that point? And then we can talk about what you did to get out of that. Mm. Thanks, Brian. Well, you know, I grew up in one of the most beautiful countries in the world where, you know, we have this wonderful lifestyle and it's, yeah, it's, it's really stunning. But I think one of the important things to understand is with everything, there's a shadow side. There's a light to every shadow and there's a shadow to every light. And unfortunately, I grew up in a um, situation that wasn't so great at home. And I think that probably by the time I was in my early teens, I was probably suffering from depression. So I was also adopted and I, I really have done a lot of research about the effects of adoption on kids. And I think that it's quite a big, big thing. That's often not, uh, sorry, Brian, can we start again? Oh yeah, dude, go, go ahead. Just totally slipped off. No, jump in. <laughs> can, do we start again? Or yeah, do just, we just, just uh, flow with it. I'll edit it in. Oh, it'll, it'll, it'll work okay. fine. Let me just make sure that's going to sit there. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't think that a lot of people understand the effects of adoption on kids. And I think it's uh, something that's quite traumatic when we think about, you know, being with this woman for nine months of your life and, and that's all you know, and then losing her and, so I think this is a, also a big piece of the puzzle for a lot of people who are adopted. Maybe they don't realize, maybe it's not been acknowledged in their family. So yeah, heading into my teenage years, just really, really suffering as lots of people do, doing really well at school and all of that, but just suffering. And by the age of 19, uh, things just came to a, to a head and I tried to take my own life. I think the despair was just overwhelming. I couldn't see a way through. And, oh, God, help me. It's doing it again. Hang on. Let me just reset this here. Okay. It, might, it's looks so, like it's, it looks like it's moving again. Oh, my again. God. This is like, give me one second to no just worries. fix this up. Hang on. I don't know why my camera is not sitting today. I have this really fancy camera. That's part of the problem. Is it? Does it, like, plug into your... Yeah, it plugs into my Mac. Okay. And that should do it. Yeah. It's just slip it. It plugs into my Mac. I mean, the Mac, the Mac uh camera is really good, but this is a Logitech. It's just where does the camera sit on? So good. It sits on the top of my my <laughs> MacBook. Oh, okay. So it sits there usually. Anyway, okay. Maybe I just start talking about adoption again. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. Like I said, I'll edit it in. We'll, we'll make it sound good. Thanks, Brian. Sorry. I'm not used to anyone editing my podcast. So one of the things that was quite big for me was that I was adopted. And I don't know that a lot of people really understand the effects of adoption on children. There's been quite a bit of research done in the last 30 years about this, but it's quite a big thing. And I think that this was an integral part of the trauma from my childhood and the struggles that I was having. Um, and by the age I hit 19, everything kind of came to a head and I tried to take my own life, which was um, just from a place of deep despair, which I know lots of people, you know, understand that sadness and despair. And I was unsuccessful, thankfully. And I remember sitting in the hospital bed and really asking myself, how is it that I've got myself into this place where things are so unbelievably difficult? And I wanted to see whether I could, you know, figure that out. Was it something genetic in me that made happiness so difficult? Was it 
something from my childhood? What was it? And was it possible for me to shift it? And then began the journey of many, many years of seeing whether I could figure this out and turn my life around. Was there, I didn't think we'd get down this path, but maybe it's relevant for folks listening in because, you know, and I have a, a young child. So I, you know, I think about these things as he's growing up. Um, were there telling signs that you were looking to take your own life or is that out of the blue from friends and family around you when that happened? It's hard for me to know what people were saying, but uh, I guess after the fact, did anyone approach you? Did you, do you remember if there were conversations like, you know what I'm saying? Like, were there signs, like did things happen yeah. prior to then? I don't um, think so. Or- I think that, I think that for a lot of us, we do everything that we can to show that we're functioning mm. and that we're okay. Because I think that we live in a world where people have, you know, often don't want to know if you're struggling that hard, they don't know how to help you. I certainly, you know, no one has suggested I get therapy or anything like that, which seems pretty standard. So I don't think so. I think, I think there was just a series of events that were happening that um, was so huge, including one of my closest friends dying, where Mm -hmm. people didn't step in and hold me, where people, yeah, didn't, um, you know, kind of left me to it to figure it out. And it was too much at 19 to go and see one of your best friends. He's dying and you, you, you go and have 10 minutes to say goodbye to him. And no one was there afterwards to help me manage those kind of experiences. I think they were too big. Um, and there was, there was a series of things around that time that was like too big. And I, I just was literally unable to cope having had, you know, probably probably this depression sitting there for quite some years yeah i think the um and you know maybe we we pair into this later on but you know, i think it's relevant to talk about now is around like the support systems and you know i look at it just personally right is i i i still love one of my favorite quotes is you know we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with because i do think it's relevant if you're around people that it's not that they don't maybe care about you, but they're not sure how to communicate with you, right? They're not there to support you. Um, maybe they are negative, right? There's a lot of different aspects. And then you put yourself in a group of people that support you. They ask how you're doing. They are there so you can be vulnerable, share your emotions, um, that you can be open if you're struggling. And that's way more rewarding. And I think ultimately it leads us to expose a lot of the things that are hurting us, which allows us to get past them. Versus the, you know, the former is you're hiding those things in. you don't want to show people because you think they're not going to like it. Um, that's not the best group of people to be around. So I, I've kind of, I kind of seen this throughout my life and maybe you can, you know, share as you've gone through your journey, how important getting the right team members, if you will, um, around you has been to your success in terms of when I say success, I mean, in terms of getting to a place where you're happier now versus prior. I think it's a mixed thing, Brian, because I think that when you're 19, all you want to do is have fun and, you know, experience things and, you know, life doesn't appear so heavy. Mm -hmm. I think that as we get older, we begin to understand, you know, those kind of patterns of who stays and who goes, who's good for me and who's not. But I don't think at 19, you've kind of figured that out. I think then you're sort of like, you're experimenting and experiencing so much and people come and go and there's lots and lots of people. Whereas now that foundation is so important. You know, there's, there's five um, areas in the world called the blue zones where people are living to really, you know, old age. Uh, They have a lot of centenarians, centenarians, whatever you call them, people who are living to a hundred in Mm -hmm. in these communities. And one is in Okinawa in Japan. And what they have there is a community when you're born of, I think it's about five people called a Moai. And they, uh, these, these five people are your people for your whole life. So from a really young age, you're brought together. And then as you get older, you come together, you come together, you come together your whole life. You might 
help each other financially if times are difficult. You will help emotionally. And it's one of the reasons they believe that people in Okinawa are living so long. There's a number of reasons in these five blue zones. They've seen what it is. Community is really important. But I find that um, model really powerful. And I'm very, very fortunate to have a group of very close friends from, you know, one has been my friend, actually two, since I was four years old. So I really have built that. And I, I, what I see with my students is when we're looking at uh, people suffering from depression, one of the first things that I look at is what is your social structure like? And there's always, without fail, a breakdown in the social structure of someone suffering from depression. So it's something that's incredibly important. And as well as, yes, the five people that, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I think what's really important that people don't take into account are also the micro encounters that we have during our day that hold us in place. And that might be the guy at the coffee shop that makes me the coffee in the morning. You know, it could be when I walk into my office, you know, when I, I usually live in Los Angeles and when I go into my office, there's a gorgeous um, man who uh, is like the security for the office. And we have this touchstone conversation every day. And those small, uh, you know, connections are also incredibly important. And I think that as we move more and more into a world where we go to the supermarket and it's all automated, you know, I think that this is really taking something really important and special away from us and for us never to underestimate how that holds a fabric of connection and communication for us in our life that is equally important in what I can see as those people that we're closest to. That's a great point. Yeah. You forget about some of those micro, um, the, those micro doses, if you will, for lack of a better phrase of, of interactions. Yeah. Cause it, it, even if it's the, you know, you're having a bad day, you walk in that coffee shop and, you know, someone greets you nice and gives you a smile that could change your mood, you know, kind of in real time. But it's right? even more important, Brian, if that's someone that has seen you regularly and yeah. they might, say hello to you by your name and they might ask how you're doing they might ask a small detail about your life how's work today or anything that enables you to feel seen Mm. so it's different from going in and seeing someone at the coffee shop that's you've never seen before it's that thing of consistency that is small that you know kind of holds our life in place that unfortunately i think is disappearing as the years go by Mm. You know, so when, when you think of it, well, I'm actually curious before we even dive deep in that, when did you discover from like what happiness actually is like in terms of a definition in your head? Because as you said, 19, you're kind of going past and learning and, and, you know, kind of exposed to, wait a minute, I want to do something different. Was there a point you remember you're like, ah, I get it now. Like whether it was just after 19, it could have been, you know, a year ago. I don't know. But like, when did you fully discover like, okay, this is kind of the definition of, of my happiness. Yeah. It was probably about 10 years later. And I remember figuring it out, figuring out what it was and going, Oh my God, how am I going to get there? You know? And I think that the, the biggest thing that I understood is we often, people will often with me, um, you know, describe what I would call joy as happiness. And I think that joy is those kind of high moments that we have, you know, those peaks that we have in our life. Whereas for me, happiness is being able to handle everything, whatever comes at me, to be able to have a groundedness and an equilibrium, no matter whether I'm in amazingly awesome circumstances or amazingly difficult circumstances. That I'm not as thrown around by, you know, the waves of the storms and I'm just able to deeply enjoy my life no matter what's going on. And I I remember starting to understand that and think, gosh, oh my God, that sounds, that sounds so amazing. And it doesn't mean that you don't get to have all the delicious, passionate highs and all of that. 
but it's just more that your everyday life is a lot more stable and whatever life throws at you, you manage it completely differently, almost, almost as though you manage it with grace, you know? Yeah. And it is such a good feeling. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think about it too. I think you and I think similarly in the fact of it's the highs and and those moments are great and you can look forward to those and it's good to have those, those um, experiences, but it's also the lows, at least how I think about it, the lows aren't as low as they used to be. Like there's a leveling up basically on the graph, if you will. Um, and if, if that's a visual for everyone, right, is yes, you're going to have your low points. You have points where you get depressed or bad days or whatever, but not only are they not as low as they used to be, but you can also get out of, you can dig your way out because now you have like a formula to help you versus before. And I can speak from experience like, oh my gosh. I mean, I go back 10 years ago, Brian, <laughs> geez, Louise. I mean, that was a different Brian. And it was like, you know, you get into a tough spot. I mean, it might be weeks or months before you get out of it, you know? Or a girlfriend breaks up with you or yeah. something like that. That is just so completely devastating, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You just don't know how to handle it. And I, I think, and this is one of the things I liked about, you know, kind of research and prior is how important, you know, you talk about the mind, right? It's not, you can have the, the fancy car, you can have the nice things, you can, you know, it makes you feel good. But the reality is if your mind is not set up properly to have that positive path forward, you're going to, you're going to get off the path a lot quicker. Um, and it might be devastating, right? Absolutely. Even today, you know, I was reading about Nadal just winning the French open again for, you know, uh, 14th time, I think. And he was, he was in this interview talking about how, you know, it's not about records. It's not about, um, you know, even about winning, that's not his success. His success is that every day that he does his best and that he's enjoying what he's doing. Mm. And I think that's probably why he's so successful because he's not chasing these numbers. He's not chasing these victories. He's not chasing these kind of milestones. What he's looking for is, am I happy when I'm doing this? And Am I able to give the absolute best of myself in every encounter that I have on the tennis court? And that makes so much sense to me that, you know, that his mental capacity would be so extraordinary because I see now the way that he looks at the work that he's doing and what he sees success as. It reminds me of, um, I didn't, yeah, and I didn't see that interview, but yeah, I mean, obviously it's pretty impressive what he's done in his career. I look at this being a golfer, it's folks that have that similar mindset is you can, you hit a bad shot, you can come back to reality a little bit quicker and get ready for the next one. You kind of forget about it versus if you're so worried about like, oh, I got to win or whatever, you're going to put so much more pressure on yourself. Like, oh, this is getting me away from that. Versus, hey, let me just execute the next time and then the next time. And eventually I add up the shots or, you know, I hit enough serves or whatever, um, you know, uh, metaphor you want to use. And eventually I get there and then I can look back and say, wow, I did it all because that those small steps day after day, you know, match after match, whatever it might be. But there's also something with golf, Brian, is that one of the most important things with golf is to relax and the more that you can relax your mind and your body, mm -hmm. having played only a little bit of golf, um, the more you're able to execute well. So it's almost counterintuitive on some levels, like that tightness actually causes you a lot of problems. And I feel that in life as well, is that the more that we can relax our way into our life, the more easily we're able to hit those winning shots. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, you know, because I, th I think that's a good thought there, because I would agree. Yeah. And as someone that you know, I used to be a PGA professional, I used to teach golf. So kind of, you know, remembering not only my own swing, but working with students is like, yeah, the freer you are, right, even if you don't have a great swing, things start timing up properly, but you start getting really tight and try to get yourself into a position. It's really hard to hit the golf ball. Would you say that's similar with, you know, or maybe it's a good uh, metaphor, I guess, of, of just people in general, because I, I see this a lot, or I've seen this in my life, and I see it with, with people I've, I've been around, that we put these stresses in our life, you know, we buy the big house, or we have this big 
you know, you know, car payment and we do all this stuff. And then we have to take a job that we don't like because it pays a certain amount so we can have these nights. You know what I'm saying? And instead of looking at like Nadal does of like, Hey, I want to have a great day today, or I want to do these things that make me happy. We almost choose a wrong path to make up for poor decisions. I don't know if that's a makes, that's a good question or not, but does that make sense? Like I see this a lot. It's almost like we don't let ourselves get on the right path. Yeah, I also think, Brian, that we're sold a lie, you know, a really big lie. And the lie is having that house is going to make you happy. Mm-hmm. Having that car that you can't afford is going to make you happy. And all of the other things that we're led into, you know, mortgaging our lives for in, in order to have, because we're told people that have these kind of things are, are powerful mm-hmm. and they're happy. And I think that that's one of the most difficult things is, I mean, think about it. Everywhere we look, we're inundated with messaging that's telling us this exact lie, you know, endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. And so I think that's where it's hard. It's almost like we've been brainwashed into it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's, it is interesting because yeah, it's like buy the new watch, buy, and by the way, that's fine. If people want to have nice things, I'm not you know, I have a house here than and what have you. But I think it's, again, this goes back to defining happiness. And maybe we can get into this a little bit more, because if you kind of know what your path is, I, I've at least found this, it helps me make better choices. If I'm looking at, you know, one of my, I don't mind sharing, like one of my keys to happiness is freedom to be able to make, like, if I want to go play golf tomorrow, or if I want to do this or that, you know, whatever, I can make those choices. I'm not bogged down as much you know, where I have to, like, I'm very, you know, the, the organization I work for, they're very flexible, which is nice where, um, the, the things I'm able to do with this podcast, whatever it is, but it's like, I don't have, it's not like you have to be in an office chair at 9am in this office, you know, right. Oh, I work remotely. Like, so there's some things I can make choices because of how I've tried to set up my life. And maybe you can agree with this. You've done similar, but how would you encourage folks that maybe have been sold a lie? have gone down that path and now they feel stuck, what do they do? What, what are the, how do they start digging themselves out? I think the first thing to understand, Brian, is that all those wonderful things that you bought aren't actually going to make you happy. They make you happy for a moment. You know, we have that little peak, you know, and, and then after a little while that wears off and we have to start looking for the next thing. And the next thing, I always call it as soon as happiness. As soon as I have this, I'll be happy. Oh, as soon as I have put that new balcony on my house, I'll be happy. Oh, as soon as I've bought the new Jeep Wrangler, I'll be happy. And we live, we live chasing these things. And initially they do, they feel great. And we, but, but if we're looking for a happiness that's going to last, that's not where we're going to find it. So I think that's the first thing to start to get realistic about. When we look at people who have all of the things that we're told will make us happy, fame, power, wealth, you know, and we look at them. I mean, would you want to be Elon Musk, you know, inside that brain with all of that stuff going on? You know, would, you know, I went and saw Lady Gaga perform a few years ago in in Las Vegas. You know, she's got, Oscars, she's got Grammys, she's got incredibly powerful, ridiculously wealthy, super talented musician, like just incredible. And she talks on stage about her mental health problems and how miserable she is. She was getting paid a million dollars a show. So when we look at all those things that we're told are going to make us happy, we have to start to get a little bit realistic with it and go, well, if that was the case, wouldn't all these people who have so much money and so much power, wouldn't they be happy? But I'm looking around and seeing, yeah, that's not quite the case. I mean, even these last few weeks, you know, the celebrities in the news with all their mess and you know, this is so much messiness with all of all of the things that we're told. It doesn't mean that you can't be happy with those things, but those things will not actually bring you happiness. Yeah, that's a great point. I I think I, I think this is partly, yeah. I I don't know how it is over, you know, where you're from, but I know in the US a lot of it is the 
hey, get an entry level job, work your way up. You know, you kind of keep up with the Joneses around you, see what other people are doing, you know, and you start to get this mentality like, oh, so and so has a new car. And then you start thinking, oh, maybe I need a new car. Well, again, if you don't, if you're always trying to chase, I like the as soon as thought, if you're always trying to chase, then you never actually have the opportunity to actually be happy today, right? Like we're, how can we be happy today with what we have? How can we have, you know, gratitude has been such a big thing. And, you know, maybe we can share some of, some of your journey as well. I mean, gratitude is just like, wow, how thankful I am for all the stuff in my life today that most people don't have. And let's, if I'm going to compare, let's use that to start versus the, you know, the, the toys. I had a, I'll, I'll shut up in a second, but I had a funny uh, professor in college. And I remember, I'll never forget it. He said, the person with the most toys doesn't win. And, and I love that <laughs> line because he's right. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's all going to end at some point. And it's like, you, you know, it's not, we're not adding up the toys and who has the fancy cars and stuff at the end, not saying you can't have those. I'm not saying those are bad, but to your point, if you prioritize incorrectly, it's not going to lead you to the right happiness, you know? But also often we, we buy these toys or we get these things to cover up our own insecurities that we're not enough as we are. Yeah. I remember years ago, I was in Thailand and right at the beginning of this journey, and I, it was my first time in Thailand and my first time in a third world country. And I was in this canal on this boat going down this little canal in the back, the back waters of Bangkok. And there was a man who was the, he was sitting under four bamboo poles that were holding up a blue tarpaulin and beside him were a few belongings and I could see very clearly that this was where he lived and I remember he was sitting there cross-legged with this look of joy on his face that I'd never seen before in my life and it was so deeply confronting to me because this went against everything I'd been led to believe how could this man with so little be so full of joy? And then I began to understand the first piece and probably the biggest piece of the puzzle, which was that happiness and suffering actually weren't coming from my external circumstances, that happiness and suffering were actually originating in my mind. And it was everything was then about what am I doing with my mind? Because there is the key. And the world will teach us because the world economy runs on it. You have to buy all these things and have all these things to be happy. But actually, truly, the only way to really be happy consistently, a happiness that's solid and will last, is by learning to tame and train that out of control mind that is creating havoc for us most of our most of our days so if someone's listening in and they agree and I, I think that's a great thought um, he, how do they start what, what do they do today what do they do this week to start shaping their mind for the better is there anything yeah. you'd share to help them out I mean, the first thing is and I know that some people will struggle when they hear this but I really want you to hear me out the first thing is, is a meditation practice is one of the most vital things that you can have in your life. And the reason is, is that the only way that you can train your mind is to actually train it. And that is what meditation practice does. It's literally going to the gym for your mind. And we all know that if we don't go to the gym and we don't work out, our bodies just become weaker and weaker and we get sick. It's the same with our mind. So we have to teach our mind and train it so that instead of our mind running the show, which it does, you know, sometimes I imagine it like, you know, we wake up in the morning and there's this, there's this door that opens to our mind and there's this wild pony that sits outside that door and we're thrown onto it and it goes all sorts of different places. And every so often it will slow down, settle down, maybe eat a little bit of grass, and then something will spook it and off it goes. And we're just literally holding on for dear life. No bridle, no saddle, nothing. And that's how our lives are. But imagine if you woke up in the morning and there was a, outside that door of your mind was a beautiful, you know, 
champion Western horse that had a beautiful bridle and saddle and you got to lead it where you wanted it to go. That is the difference between a mind that has been trained and a mind that hasn't. So we'll always be at the mercy of our mind if we don't learn how to work with it. So everything that's happened to us in our life will have an effect on us because it's almost like a external hard drive, you know, plugged into our mm. computer where all these past experiences that we've had create reactive responses. Mm. So maybe you're, you know, having a conversation with your girlfriend or boyfriend and they say something and you get that feeling of rage or you're triggered. It's not even about what they're saying. It's about what's happened in the past that's triggering a habitual response. So understanding that due to our mind, we're actually really set up in a pattern of habits that we don't even realize, that all very subconscious. So it's vital that through working with the mind, we start to have a conscious relationship with our mind, with our past experiences and with ourselves. And if we can do that, we can actually start to take control of our whole life. And it's completely a game changer. I call meditation my superpower mm. because it seems so simple, but it is such a deep, deep, powerful practice. And I know a lot of people struggle with meditation or they think, gosh, I can't meditate. You know, I, I, I can't have no thoughts. My mind's too busy to meditate, but meditation isn't about not having any thoughts. It's about learning how to work with those thoughts. So lots of thoughts are welcomed. You know, the mind naturally has lots of thoughts. You're not going to anyone who sits there and says to you, oh, I just meditated for the last hour and had no thoughts. It's completely telling you a fantasy story, unless maybe they're the Dalai Lama could probably do that. But for mere mortals like us, there's, there's not a hope. So it's really important to understand if you're afraid of meditation because you think your mind's too busy, then I say to you, welcome, you know, bring that busy mind in and let's work with it because a busy mind is, is the perfect mind to bring into a meditation practice. And does it have to be, you know, I've done both guided meditations. I've done just kind of sitting with my eyes closed. Do, is there a preference, do you think, or something someone should try to start? Yeah, I think that you need to learn from a qualified teacher. So I think that's really important. You need to learn from someone who has a lot of experience with meditating. I think we live in a world now where, you know, there's lots of people that have gone and studied for a year or done a weekend course that are you know, kind of teaching these guided meditations. But meditation is a, a deep process that you need to learn from someone who really understands the mind so that you can ask them questions as you go on your journey. So I, that is the first thing that's really important. And the second thing is that it's important to understand that there's a difference between meditation and creative visualization. So creative visualization would be more like, you know, I take you somewhere by a stream and I want you to relax. That's meditative and relaxing, but it's not actually learning the practice of meditation. And the practice of meditation in its essence is teaching you how to bring your mind back into the present moment. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a gym muscle, like, you know, you're, you're lifting the, the weight for your bicep curl over and over again bringing you back into the present moment. And that is the skill that you're learning. So it's important from, from where I sit, from all the years that I've studied this, um, to find a program or a teacher that is teaching you, how do I bring my mind back into the present moment? Because you think about it like this, Brian, it's like our mind is constantly dancing. Thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, very rarely in the present moment. But if I was to say to you, what did you do at this time two weeks ago? You would have probably no idea or a very subjective idea of what had happened. I could have been in the same place at the same time and your memories will be quite different from my memories. So our memories are kind of imaginings, really. They're just little snippets of information that were filtered out. And so 
the past isn't real and the future hasn't come yet. So that's just an imagining as well. So the future isn't real either. So the only moment that's real is this moment. And if I can teach you how to bring your mind slowly but surely more consistently into the present moment, your stress and your anxiety starts to dissolve because the stress and anxiety is driven by not being here, by dancing into worries about the future, concerns about the past. Just be here and everything starts to settle. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, one of my favorite quotes uh, by Seneca, you know, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. You know, they, we were so worried about the future, things that haven't even happened yet versus just kind of being focused on the present day. And I can speak from you know my experience. I mean, I started meditating probably 2016 um, now, and I don't do it as often as I used to. Um, but I will tell you that, in, and everyone listening in, it's it's been a game changer for me in terms of, to exact your point, understanding. It's, it's helped my golf game, that's for sure. But just in general, getting in an argument, doing those type of things where I would get really hot really quick. And I think a lot of that I grew, you know, from my parents, from grandparents, I was around somebody that I, I learned that um, versus now being able to take that step back in real time and kind of pausing and almost like thinking. It's almost like slows down the game, if you will. Um, and that's at least what I've got of it, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like the gap, you know, the gap is created, you know, mm. you have the ability when you put your golf ball down to take that moment and really set yourself up. And you know, that if you set yourself up and you think the shot through to some degree and then let go, you, you're going to do a better shot. But if you were to walk up to the, you know, to the golf ball and just hit the ball, it's very hit and miss, hmm. but that's what we do. We kind of, you know, something will happen and, and then we'll just walk up to the golf ball and hit it. And we wonder why our lives are so messy. Yeah. Whereas meditation teaches you, oh, that reactive thought comes up and I, and I get a choice. I have the, the, the choice to decide, do I go with that hot emotion? Or do I actually slow things down and take a beat and choose how I'm going to respond rather than reacting? You know, it's a little bit like when you have your mobile phone on silent, you know, and the, the phone goes straight to voicemail. That's how quickly we're responding all of the day. So bringing that consciousness in means that we're able to respond completely differently in our lives. But it doesn't just happen automatically, unfortunately, because the mind is so trained in the habitual patterns of however many years we've been alive mm. we have to do it we have to train it consciously it can't just happen by hoping we can be more conscious or wishful thinking because the habits are of the mind are just you know they're just too trigger happy and and they happen without us even realizing it yeah and as you're speaking there, it kind of made me think of, um, you know, one of the other applications of this, which I didn't really realize early on, obviously it's, it's come on a lot more, um, over the last couple of years is with CrossFit. So it's something I do a lot. Um, and obviously, you know, not only keeps me fit, but I think mentally it's, it's very, um, challenging, but when you have these longer workouts and we call them Metcons and, it's easy to quit in your mind because you know, oh my God, I got 15 more minutes or 20 more, whatever it is. But, and this is where the present moment thing I'm going back to is just being able to know like, hey, I'm in, let me do this move or let me get through these next five. Like keeping these very short kind of goals right in front of you, you eventually chip away and get to the end. It's like, I try to teach my son, I don't run a lot, but like we might go out to like the trail or we might do something like a, a short run or something. And I always try to teach them, like, don't worry about the finish line. Just, I was like, you see that tree up in the distance? Let's just get to the tree. And then once we're there, let's get to the next. And, and kind of, the, you know, like, again, staying so in the moment where you don't get your mind thinking that you're going to quit because there's nothing to quit. You only have a couple more. Oh, and then you have to set a new quick goal. I don't know if that, that makes sense, but like, that's how I think yeah. like this, you know, the staying in the present moment um, versus in the past, it'd be like, ah, oh, that's such a long word. I can't do that. I can't run that or, you know, and you start really getting a defeatist mindset. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that when you learn meditation, what you see is the same probably with your son. You start to see results pretty quickly. You know, I find within 30 days, people are seeing quite a change in themselves and uh, or someone in their life is. And I think that that also creates the motivation, you know, where you show your son, oh, let's get to this tree. And then he gets there and then the confidence builds. Oh, well, maybe I can get to the next tree and maybe the next yeah. tree. I fully agree with you. Like breaking things up like that is so incredibly powerful, but the mind's so deeply habitual. You know, you might, you might look beyond that tree and think, gosh, I tried to run that once before and I wasn't able to do it or I hurt my leg or, oh my God, we were made to do this at school and it was so miserable. And the mind is so busy, you know, feeding you all of this information yeah. all the time. So it's really, really vital that we get it under control. So, so the, the general thesis here in our short time together is not, again, whether it's we've got ourselves into a hole, maybe it's financially, maybe it's a job we don't want, anything like that. It's not quitting tomorrow or doing whatever. It's really sitting back, almost taking a step back, start to develop our minds better, our kind of patterns of thinking. And that's going to propel us forward to make better decisions on what really makes us happy. Because I always say that the thought is like, we only can discover happiness once we can discover ourselves. Like if we don't know what makes us happy, if we're not going to dig down deep inside us, we're just making it up. We're kind of just throwing things out there because we're not actually listening to ourselves. And I think we know the answer. I just don't think a lot of us want to acknowledge what the answer is, right? I think that you say something interesting though, because you say, if we, you know, do this practice and train our mind that we will discover what makes us happy. And I would argue as we do this work and train our mind, it will make us happy. Mm. So, so it's not even that we end up having these things that make us happy. It's like, it's like our happiness levels raised to a point where kind of everything is making us happy. You know, wherever we're engaged, whatever we're doing, we're feeling much bigger levels of happiness. And then we'll have these things of, oh, you know, I'm off-roading in my Jeep and I love it and it's awesome. And that's kind of a, a high joy point or, you know, I'm hanging out with my niece and I really love it or whatever it is. But that actually those levels of happiness raise up to a point where I'm cooking dinner that maybe I don't enjoy so much and I'm studying, I, I feel happy, you know? I'm writing an email and I'm feeling really happy. So it, it's not attaching the happiness to certain things. It's that we have an overwhelming feeling of happiness that's sitting with us through our whole day. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, what I'm gathering is more, we're just, we're happy we're here in the present day. Like we're you know, kind of go back to Nadal's thing. We're, we're here. We're just going through the motions and that should make us happy more than trying to look out to the, the summit of the next mountain and always trying we just to get are. there. Yeah, we just are. You know, there was, a, there was a documentary made many years ago by two guys in Australia. They went looking for the happiest community in the world and they believe they found it in a slum in Mumbai, hmm. right? I've, I've traveled extensively through India. I traveled for four years through India on a motorcycle by myself. And I saw levels of, mental wellness that far exceeded anything I saw in the consumeristic West. So it's really important for us to, to understand that, you know, it's about, it's about life can be really happy, no matter if you're in a slum in Mumbai or you're on a dull, it all depends on your mind and the responses that your mind is having. Mm. There's a, Great story I was told many years ago by a beautiful uh, um, Tibetan Buddhist Lama who was taken into uh, prison when the China invaded Tibet. He was in prison for 21 years. And he told me the story about how he went into this prison cell and there was another guy in the cell with him that were cellmates, of course, very quickly. They became best friends. And this Tibetan Buddhist Lama was, you know, he was a master of meditation. He was one of the great masters in Tibet at the time. And he said, you know, my friend and I were in the cell together and my friend really struggled. He, 
he really struggled. It was difficult. And I tried to help him and I tried to help him. He said, well, one day I woke up. He said, we slept on a mat on the floor together. And I woke up and he'd found something to cut himself and he had taken his own life. He said, I think about it like this. Here we were two men from the same village at the same age and the same physical health in the exact same cell under the exact same circumstances. And one of us suffered so much that they took their own life and the other didn't suffer at all. And the only difference between the two of us was that one of us had trained their mind and the other hadn't. And I never forgot that story. It was so powerful for me to see whatever the circumstances, whatever is going on, no matter how good or bad, you can be okay if you've learned how to work with your mind. That's a great, that's a great story. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense too. What, what would you share with folks as we kind of wrap up here? You know, again, they're getting started. They're thinking about maybe meditation, those type of things. Is there any other encouragement? Maybe it's a quote you live by. I, I like to say, like, if you had a post-it note, someone's putting it on their, their computer to look at day in, day out. Is there anything you would share with them to get them kind of moving forward in a better direction? I want to give you two that I can think of off the top of my head, my two favorites. The first one is don't believe everything you think. I love that. Wow. Don't believe everything you think. And also, um, I'm friends with Lauren Velez, who many of you know, she would play Maria La Guerta in Dexter. And uh, she, she was in a play some years ago that I went to see in LA. And there was a line from that play that I absolutely loved. I can't remember the name of the play, but the line was, if you're eating a shit sandwich, the chances are you made it. Mm. And I love that, right? Yeah. We are responsible for ourselves. And I think that's one of the most difficult things for us to understand. If we're in a bad situation, somehow we've created it. But equally, we can create our way out of it. Yeah. And so working with the mind, not believing everything that you think, then becomes such a profound thing to live by. That's a great point. We have control, even though sometimes we don't think we do. Yeah. I think part of it is, do we actually want to, th th this is the, the crux of it is, do we actually want to make that decision, right? So it goes back to, again, we'll use a simple analogy, like the big house or something that maybe you can't afford, or you're struggling because you have to work this job you don't like just to keep it up we would rather that struggle. So we look good to other people versus wiping that clean because it makes us happy. It makes us less stressful, less worrisome, but getting over that hump is really the big challenge, right? Or, or it could be another way of looking at it, Brian is here. I've got this big house that I absolutely love and it makes me feel good. And I feel valuable and respected and I'm working this job that I can't stand on one level to understand that their house is never going to give you the happiness you're looking for. And that if I take deep self-responsibility for myself, I may say, well, I can't do this house anymore. Or I may say, I need to completely change my job. I need to mm -hmm. find, yep. I need to take responsibility for this work that I'm not happy in and see whether I can find something making the same amount of money to afford this house until I figure out it won't make me happy. But maybe, but maybe the house is really big and it is a home where you can entertain lots of people and it brings everyone together. And, you know, it brings you joy in that way. It's okay to have a big house, yeah. Absolutely. but to then not be the victim to it, mm -hmm. to not think, Oh, I have to do this job. You don't have to do this job. You're choosing this job. You're choosing to do it. Okay. So, choose again? Can you choose a different job? So once we start to take responsibility for our mind, what we start to see is that it's time to give up being the victim in our life. And that's painful because it's so much easier for us to, you know, blame someone else when things don't go right. So that's the painful bit. But the glorious bit about it is, is that we can then start to say, well, I can be the master of my own life because the responsibility does lie at my feet. And every day I am making a series of choices. And the more conscious I can become of those choices, the more effective that I'm going to be in my life. So it creates that freedom that you talk about. 
the freedom to be able to choose my life as I want it because I'm living it consciously rather than unconsciously. Money, that's a good, uh, that's a good stopping point right there. I think we'll, uh, we'll put the period on the conversation and uh, maybe you pick up another part two down the road. Who knows? Um, where can everyone say hello to you online? Where's the best spot to connect? Sure. You can find me at my website, moniqueroads.com. I do a daily podcast called In Your Right Mind. And yeah, everything's there. You can come and find out about me. I'm very active with my students. So if you come and do some work with me, I'll, I'll be right in there helping you every step of the way. Monique, thank you so much. This was a blast and I appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Brian. Look forward to seeing you on the golf course.